so much for uh, this webinar. It's really truly an honor for both myself and our team of Science for Ukraine to be invited to have this webinar on Science for Ukraine. And uh, we are very grateful to web to learn for organizing it and organizing it in, in this exact date uh, because it holds a special significance for uh, our organization, Science for Ukraine, as exactly two years ago uh, on this day, we started, uh, we started to be, we started to uh, work in support of Ukrainian uh, scholars and students. So thank you so much. Щиро висловлюю, вітаємо, щиро висловлюємо вам нашу глибоку вдячність. Для нас велика честь взяти участь в сьогоднішньому вебінарі у зв'язку з двома, двома роками е, війни і е, нашої наполегливої праці з е, українськими науковцями та студентами. Е, щиро дякуємо вам. Дякую вам, Катерина. Let us start with a short introduction of the uh, Agile project. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, this is uh, the third webinar of the Agile project. This webinar today is uh, a very special one dedicated for Science of Ukraine, a unique um, initiative that we are tremendously glad to uh, host two years of grassroots activism in support of Ukrainian science during uh, the war. The Agile project started in 2023. Uh, the objective is to increase resilience of inclusive higher education systems uh, regarding the needs of refugees through social participation and recognition of skills. Uh, the, the two specific objectives of the Agile project, the first is to enable to ease the integration of refugees uh, in the professional uh, life and study at universities and also do that do this by combining digital innovation social participation and impact assessment to facilitate integration it is a project that is funded by the french national agency we have the big pleasure to have university paris 8 uh, coordinate coordinate this beautiful um, initiative. In today's webinar, we have three renowned uh, speakers. I will introduce you the first one, uh, Sanita Esone. Sanita is a senior researcher and head of the Digital Humanities Research Group at ILFA, Latvia. ILFA stands for Institute of, for Literature, Folklore and Art at the University of Latvia. Sanita is adjunct professor at Riga Technical University. Her research interests connected to digital cultural heritage and participatory methods. And Science for Ukraine uh, is uh, her, uh, one of her babies. Uh, she is the initiator and co-coordinator of Science for Ukraine. We are deeply honored to have you, Sanita. The floor is yours. Thank you, Katerina. Here we go. <clears throat> Hello again, and um, uh, thanks for introduction. Uh, yes, Science for Ukraine. Uh, if we think about what grassroots is, then Science for Ukraine is truly it. Uh, we started, as I mentioned already, uh, two years ago, following the events in Ukraine. And our aim was and still is to help Ukrainian academic communities in the ways that we can, that we can uh, helping to survive this uh, period of war um, and also to help uh, to continue um, their research studies and uh, to be, keep being um, in academia internationally. And over the span of these two years, we have gone through various phases of development, including rapid expansion and also reduction. But nonetheless, acknowledging that unfortunately the war is not being stopped and its critical impact on Ukrainian uh, academic field is for long term, uh, we took a serious step 
uh, by officially registering Science for Ukraine as a non-governmental organization, which also helps to secure our sustainability and uh, also to um, um, use additional possibilities that NGO status grants. <clears throat> but the start was quite emotional. Uh, as we remember, uh, February 24, two years ago, uh, when Russia launched a full-scale war against Ukraine, it was a massive shock and emotional blow for many, for me as well. And uh, the first thought for many of us was, uh, how can I help? And in the initial days, as we all probably remember, there was a lot of information, rapid development of events, and then there was academic Twitter, as we can call it, which was closely following the events and uh, one after another statements condemning Russia's aggression uh, from universities and various science organizations began to appear along with uh, offers of help. And with each hour and day, the number of offers of assistance for Ukrainian scholars and students became more and more, but as soon as they slid away from the timeline, they practically became unfindable. And uh, I was closely following academic Twitter, waiting for some hashtag or some account to appear um, that would, I don't know, collect or, or suggest something unified. Um, <clears throat> but um, as time gone, and, and we counted time in hours then, actually, the, the, everything was happening so quickly and, 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 and it was really, really um, hard to just sit and, and watch media. So uh, what I did, I created a simple Twitter account and called for action. I used, I invited to use hashtag signs for Ukraine to make uh, our support offers more easily to find. And the goal of this account was precisely that, to retweet all the support offers for Ukrainian scientists and students so they could be found. But parallel to this, on the same day, I also started creating a spreadsheet to register those offers in a structured way. And with the help of my uh, colleague, uh, developer Uldis Tirsis, uh, we created a very simple website uh, with a map in the center, uh, so aligning this to the uh, refugee uh, scholars and students that are fleeing Ukraine, and that uh, hoping that map view could uh, help them to find uh, spots where they can find some help. So what were my initial expectations? I thought I would be working alone on retweeting support offers, registering them, uh, hoping that it will be useful to someone. But uh, however, things turned out differently. And uh, seeing the significant, uh, significant response uh, to the Twitter account I created, uh, I reached out to the Polish Association of Young uh, Scholars, uh, who already have started helping me finding offers on, on Twitter. And uh, similarly, several scholars um, contacted me on Twitter, expressing interest to get involved in this initiative, provide uh, more help. So uh, after two days, we were a team of four people, but the interest in joining the initiative kept growing within two weeks. Uh, so within two weeks, we became a group of already 30 volunteers, but after two months, we had approximately 100 um, volunteers from different countries. And finally, in uh, three months, uh, we had grown to 130 volunteers from 32 countries with a new website, a broad coverage on media in many countries, and also with a wide circle of followers on social media, and also with many um, ideas on how we can help Ukrainian um, scholars and students. Uh, so while preparing our three months report, on Science for Ukraine's activities, we conducted a survey among our uh, participants to find out who they are. Um, and uh, here we observed that nearly all the broader scientific fields were represented, uh, but especially our volunteers were connected with the natural sciences and social sciences. And um, volunteers held position across all academic levels, I'd say, with a significant proportion being professors and um, senior researchers. However, there were also many postdoctoral researchers and students. 
uh, as well as individuals from professional fields, not always directly related to um, science. So, uh, what's there and actually still are our aims? So, first of all, we are we keep um, collecting and dissemination information, um, what support is available for Ukrainian researchers and students at all levels. We keep our database updated. We curate it on a daily uh, basis, and this is our like main our main uh, field where we are uh, working since the first day. Um, additionally, we are raising awareness among international academic community um, on national levels, um, engaging with policy makers, funders, um, speaking about the needs, the need to support Ukrainian scholars and students. Uh, we are collaborating with different organizations in Ukraine and also beyond, uh, formulating the needs, uh, collaborating to make our voices and actions more heard and more impactful. And as we, uh, as an NGO, we started also to raise funding uh, to provide specific support um, where it's most needed for Ukrainian uh, scholars and students and where we do not see it's enough from international uh, response. Um, so the large number of participants that we had in initial months uh, required quite a coordinated organization of our work. And here you can see how the organization was structured during its most intense active phase. So there were four main coordinators along myself, Mikhail Rose, uh, whom you will hear uh, later today, uh, who, who very, uh, in a very organized and smart manner handled international coordination that was indeed very much needed, as you can imagine, smart 130 people coming into one Slack space and trying to help with everything they need. So it's it's really about how we organize ourselves. Uh, Maciej Maril from Poland served as an external communication coordinator and, and he was uh, the one who initially uh, <clears throat> organized, coordinated our outreach to funders, to large organizations, uh, setting up uh, partner networks, etc. Uh, Sasha Ivashenko, uh, you will hear after me, um, amazing um, scholar um, with large capacity and, 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 and she managed initial uh, outreach with Ukrainian institutions and also actively participated in in many other areas. And uh, Matis Reinfeldt's uh, Austrian Latvian scholar um, was responsible for uh, data curation management because at that time when we received 100 and more listings per day, it was also quite a, quite a work. Um, our work was conducted both within country groups because there were people that um, joined, several people from one country, so uh, they could uh, <clears throat> organize <clears throat> their work and, and, and activities uh, within a country groups. <clears throat> and we had also various task groups focused on activities such as data collection and processing, communication, responding to support requests because we were consulting uh, through emails, um, Ukrainian scholars and students, and also reaching out to uh, Ukrainian institutions. So over the time, um, as volunteer activity became to in, uh, decrease, and it happened around, uh, I guess, May, June uh, 2022. Uh, so we periodically had to reevaluate and adjust the structure of the organization. And currently it's structured approximately like this. So we work uh, with regular tasks that include uh, database, social media, and help requests, and uh, with projects as we call them. So where the involvement of participants is based on their interest, their availability. So it's not that uh, st stable, it just, uh, appears when it's needed and, and, and project coordinators attract the team and of course communication is our joint effort. Um, yes, 
this is communication, a really big thing. Um, and we are working in three directions. First is international scholarly community, keeping to raise awareness, um, approaching with messages, um, and also um, inviting to use Science for Ukraine database as a single information point where this information is uh, available, updated, uh, and uh, easily to find. And then we are also working towards policymakers, governments, science administrations, etc. Um, and also, of course, Ukrainian academic community showing solidarity, showing our support, and also inviting to um, <clears throat> use our resources as they need, and also contact us if if, if they need um, support. Um, our uh, members have been active authors, uh, publishing articles and newsletters in international science communication outlets, uh, such as Science, Nature, hum Human Behavior, Times Higher Education, and, and elsewhere, discussing, explaining, calling for action, providing uh, information what is urgently needed, uh, how can we international academic community can help Ukrainian um, scholars. We also um, made several dedicated uh, campaigns highlighting um, urgent needs. And, and for example, you can see this um, support scholars who remained in Ukraine because at the beginning uh, they were quite a forgotten and uh, they circumstances and 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 everything was so uh difficult and and, and hard that uh it really needed to speak loudly about the situation of those who remained in ukraine um and um <clears throat> yes and uh yes several uh, different others you can see that we have released at least nine large press releases uh, we are translating them in as many languages as we can. We are we have our uh, uh, lists of media, etc., where we or send them in an organized way, um, trying to make impact. But of course, um, the response uh, is decreasing. If at the beginning it was uh where everyone was very supportive and 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 there were a lot of publications uh, in media etc now it's a bit harder to get but um we still try um and where did those 130 people <laughs> disappear uh, well as we are uh a, a smaller size group now so there were a lot of side initiatives um, taken by our members. Um, so uh, for example, uh, UK group was very active as many people involved. They uh, established UK mentoring scheme, uh, which is uh, working very well and they are also attracting um, money for that and, 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 and working on UK level very and very visible. Uh, we have tried to um, cooperate with different organizations in organizing conferences. Uh, for example, a Chance for Science conference was one, and also Ukraine crisis uh, in higher education was also a high-level conference. Uh, we have tried to provide a smaller grants, smaller scholarships, what, whatever we could. Um, also providing mentoring and, and networking and some training. And it was actually done without NGO status. Um, but uh, once we have that one, we, we have, as I mentioned, more opportunities to perhaps attract funding or also to make uh, fundraising, what Sasha will tell uh, about. And uh, it's always nice to see that help makes a difference. And, and initially, it was uh, not quite understandable: is it working or not? And so, but uh, starting from the May, we started to receive tweets and uh, email messages, so we could see that yes, Science for Ukraine uh, has helped, helped to find hosts, etc. And then, of course, the Mikhail's uh, coordinated uh, study about uh, how effective was this database, etc. It will be um, told more about that later today. 
but of course we face some challenges and um, <clears throat> yes the situation changed constantly it was so unpredictable it made it quite difficult to forecast future needs to plan in I don't know, even in a month. And, and the organization was quite large. So we always need to be on the a top alert to be uh, ready to change something, to intervene somewhere, adapt to the changes. So it, it was a challenge of uh, planning for the long term. And actually, none of us believed that it will take so long. Uh, so it was like a very fast action to help this um, people suffering from war, but none of us could imagine that it would take so long. So it also uh, was for ourselves to ask uh, how <clears throat> long are we, uh, can we volunteer? And uh, I think um, establishing an NGO, it, it gives uh, some, some, some future prospects and sustainability. Um, and the, of course, the nature of volunteering brought uh, itself a set of challenges. So our approach was, okay, we are not giving any pressure to anyone, but, and, and everyone uh, works as much they can uh, and, and can find a way, et cetera. But it also sometimes creates some kind of uncertain, uncertainty in planning that uh, it's, yeah, that's, that's all into your specifics. Um, and also balancing expectations, needs, and what our organization can, uh, what's our capacity, um, and yes, the sustainability. Um, as we didn't have even a bank account, but we used some services, paid services, etc. It always we had to keep in mind. So what's what what will happen? What will happen next? How long can we uh, run in uh, simply like initiative? So. Um, yes, finding the necessary resources and support became crucial to continue to support for the academic community of Ukraine in a meaningful way. So thank you. I give the floor back to Katrina. Uh, thank you, Sanita. We are all yes, and already there are questions from the very first speaker. So th th this is a sign of very big interest uh, from the audience. Sanita, is, is it a good time to ask, um, to share the polls with the audience? Would you like me to, to do this? I, I share one poll, you see the results and you can uh, comment. Uh, yes, but let, actually, Karina and Sasha's presentation is quite connected. And maybe we can just continue with Sasha and do things then because it really dives deeper into what I said, at least in the last slides. Okay, just uh, then, just one, one, one poll now, and then during um, Sasa's uh, talk, of course. So this is uh, the the first one. The question is, what best describes your current involvement with initiatives related to Ukraine? Thank you very much for voting. Please go on very well. Sanita, would you like um, to comment on the results? Well, I somehow do not see my screen anymore. Ah, yes, it, it's a small window. Michael, Sasha, would you like to do so? Because it, it's your baby. Science for you can, I, I don't, I don't, I see, I do not see results. Yeah. I think you have to click on share with the audience. Yeah, we don't After have to use that. Okay, because it was people people voted. All right. Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. Sanita, would you like yes. to do? Are they visible? Mm. Super. Yes, it's visible now. And so we see that half of us is uh, very active in, 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 in the field we are talking about today. Um, and 30% uh, interested in getting involved and looking for opportunities. So anyone... <laughs> Willing to getting involved, very welcome to Science for Ukraine, of course. 
Um, and uh, nice to hear that uh, there are people uh, willing to learn more about the situation and, and the initiative. Thank you. Um, maybe just before moving to my presentation, uh, we can launch poll number two because it's uh, my pleasure. logically, oh. it will <laughs> help to see how people uh, see the question of uh, support. And then I will show what are we trying to do. Yes, of course. Yes. So here is poll number two. What role should the international scientific community play in supporting Ukrainian science? Please vote and uh, you'd be delighted to have Sasha comment on the results. What role should the international scientific community play in supporting Ukrainian science? Very well. Sasha, over to you. Am I? My question was also over there above, so that's uh, <laughs> uh, that's nice to see. Yeah, so also what, what you will see my presentation consists just of a few slides, and I would like to show an overview of the, how we are trying to stay engaged and how we're trying to support Ukrainian scientific um, community. Um, but yeah, so the situation is complex, and how Sanita, as Sanita mentioned, it evolves over time. So I will try to show how we're trying to tackle all of these points. Uh, let me start. Sasha, please, yeah, uh, 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 as you do, I would like to introduce you to the audience. So uh, Sasha Ivashenko is a senior medicine physicist at the Department of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging at the University Medical Center in Groningen in the Netherlands. Sasha is very active in science communication and holds several editorial and scientific communication positions, including Marie Curie Alumni Association, European Federation of Organizations for Medical Physics, and COST programs. She is one of the coordinators of Science for Ukraine. Sasha, over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Thank you. Great. Um, <clears throat> Thank you very much for giving this chance to um, present the webinar and uh, focusing on such a great uh, topic. Um, unlike uh, Sanita or Michael, I'm not a co-founder of Science for Ukraine, but I joined it uh, very early on. I think I was probably the first Ukrainian person uh, to join as Ukrainian. Um, um, I'm Ukrainian by um, I'm, I'm, I'm Ukrainian person that relocated and uh, work in Europe for half my life already yeah. <laughs> sounds weird um and just as sanita when the war started i was just trying to find ways of uh, uh helping and uh, get engaged and my role within the organization evolved over time but at first i was involved in establishing connection with uh, ukrainian partners and i'm uh, more in uh, now also in contact with various scholarly uh, associations and stakeholders uh, so we will go through a few slides uh, trying to show, explain how we are finding new support pathways and trying to understand what Science for Ukraine um, can do to stay relevant. So as Sanita mentioned, in general, Science for Ukraine has four main objectives. We collect and disseminate information, rate awareness, collaborate, and trying to raise funding and, uh, funding and provide support. Uh, that was and stays our goal, but um, as the situation involves and we already entered the third year of the work. Um, our activities and the amount of work that we can take on and the relevance changes as well. That's why as a, a specific, since becoming an NGO, we actually started, um, since becoming an NGO, decreasing significantly in size. So I think now we have like 30, 40 people. We needed also to start in thinking about the fact how much can we commit and how can we and all, all of us that are now there are committed for long term. So there's people that really intrinsically motivated to help. So you're also trying to find a way to identify relevant supports and make sure that we can do uh, focus on them long term. Because um, 
it's not a short time response to what we had in the beginning, just trying to centralize information. It's also not a mid range. We are talking about long term support and making sure that the solutions that we are uh, suggesting and uh, trying to communicate with the stakeholders actually will facilitate mm -hmm. rebuilding of Ukraine support current science and rebuilding in the future. So um, these are four uh, core goals that we are working on, also uh, trying to focus on uh, funding uh, to make sure that they will be at a different level in this act, uh, keeping the Ukrainian topic alive. Um, I will show um, in more details in the ne uh, next line, but it primarily means that we need to make sure that um, um, major associations such as Colorado Trees, International Science Council, uh, Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, so all the primarily organizations that actually existed for a long time and were always focusing on support for displaced scientists keep talking about Ukraine because it's there are many conflicts in the world and it's important to keep the topic alive, first of all. And second of all, um, in the first few months, thousands of thousands of people we're contacting science in Ukraine in search for positions, and uh, we developed, um, uh, let's say, a brand and a website that people know and go to. So we have an information. We have also contact with a lot of stakeholders in Ukraine. And one of responsibilities and roles for us is to uh, translate the information and needs that we hear to the stakeholders to help them design the programs and support and educate significant funding when it can be allocated to meaningful courses. Centralizing information that just a standard database so that we have, we had it and we will continue having it. Support professional growth of Ukrainian scientists. So here you can think about ways of making sure that competitiveness of Ukrainian scientists are integrated into European, very highly competitive scientific um, um, forum that because science are very, very competitive. You need to make sure that you are not only a good uh, scientists, but let's say you can brand yourself, you can express yourself very good in English, you can prefer a good pitch, you can write grants in an inappropriate way. So focusing on uh, increasing competitiveness and investing in youth. Uh, let's let's uh, be truthful that for every scientific community, a community, longevity is the fact that young scientists stay in science and it's very difficult time. So we need to make sure that we try to help and try to raise funds and design help to design problems that will help young PIs to grow. Uh, so keeping the Ukraine topic alive, what do I mean? Um, this support for Ukrainian scientists is a very topical uh, uh, issue and is being actively uh, discussed. I would like to share an example of a specific forum that was established two years ago and we actively involved in it and will likely take over coordination of it. Uh, that's a forum of more than 30 uh, international organizations, including International Science Council, uh, National Research Foundation of Ukraine, SARS, or, so, so Europe, uh, 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 United Nations, uh, High Commission for Refugees, Maria Sklodowska Curie Action, with, as well as speed of uh, Maria Sklodowska Actions for Ukraine, uh, and other agencies. And that's a dedicated <laughs> forum that initially was meeting every month as um, when the situation was very rapid, now meets every month, uh, can rec maybe re will reduce to uh, every um, uh, every quarter uh, where the information exchange happens. So when I mean, we have reports like Michael is preparing or relevant information about changes in Ukrainian um, uh, situation, they are communicated to stakeholders when a new calls are developed, we brainstorm during them trying to understand what are uh, the critical aspects for it, let's say flexible mobility, chance to go back to uh, Ukraine. Uh, those are the forums where usually calls before being published, like months, months in advance, they are brainstorming and people designing them, uh, share information with each other. Um, uh, the, uh, the forum organized also two Ukraine crisis conferences and reports that are endorsed and co coordinated by International Science Council. These are reports that are not just reports, they're actually being integrated for. So let's say the, uh, uh, the Ukraine crisis uh, conference, the first report, uh, largely the Maria Skandoski Curie Actions for Ukraine debate program is implemented, was based on those action points like uh, um, um, 
uh, support for family, uh, language development, mobility options, all of them are integrated there. Um, and uh, more will come. Uh, the, the frequency is decreasing because we are moving into mid to long uh, range um, uh, support option. Uh, but there are we are we are supporting it and will uh, keep the topic alive. Um, as an NGO, <clears throat> so we are trying uh, something to show some uh, um, calls that we had for action, like remote, remote support opportunities. Um, after becoming an NGO, one of the uh, shortcomings that we've seen is the support for uh, academic mobility, I mean, attendance of international conferences, making sure that Ukrainian scientists are, uh, are heard on the international platform. Um, and it's very important to understand that there are high budget cuts, that it was devaluation of the currency, nearly 50% since the start of the war. So even if support state continues, the amount of that people can pay, uh, uh, things that I think people can pay from it uh, was affected. And there is no international uh, support programs that can help Ukrainian scientists to actually register for conferences and, and attend them. Um, so we have an ongoing program that's called Academic Micro Travel Trends that are largely donations based. Uh, it's designed for conferences and symposium tenants as, as, as well as in person uh, and remote from Ukraine when people are presented. So you can use it for to pay for registration fee, lump sum of 500 euro. It's um, it's a fast uh, program with limited number of positions that is highly, largely donation based. So first of all, please share it. Uh, also, if you know companies that um, uh, uh, can uh, contribute as corporate partners, we also have corporate partner uh, support package that we can share and discuss with them. So please share uh, for people that uh, can contribute and donate since that can really benefit uh, scientists, as well as if you know people that uh, might benefit from the program, please share so that they will be able to apply. The program opened in February and will be definitely open until the end of this year with first decision of three weeks. Um, other programs similar to micro travel grants that we had in the past and will pick up uh, in the future uh, after acquiring additional funding are uh, things like improving language skills. So that's what I said, the competitiveness. In 2020, uh, 2023, uh, we received the Maria's Claude, uh, uh, Maria uh, Korea Alumni Association Social Impact the fact that it was a small grant of just uh, 1500 and was uh, just to show that even a little amount of money can actually make an uh, impact. So the way we decided to uh, use it is to pay for language skills, uh, for language courses of scientists, and over 70 applicants applied on those 50 scientists were uh, uh, were eligible, and for eight of them, we covered academic English or just uh, um, um, academic English courses at various levels. Some of them were very advanced, C1, some other two, but just even 1500 had an, uh, had an effect and impact um, um, for eight of them. And we are currently looking for uh, larger scales, finding opportunities to uh, um, expand it, in this case also in collaboration with Ukrainian companies, because we want to make sure that the courses that we will stimulate will actually benefit not only Ukrainian sciences, but we will be able to support uh, companies. Um, um, other ongoing calls that we have um, and would like to extend to other disciplines is the collaboration between the European Federation of Medical Physics and uh, is the European Society of uh, Radiation Oncology. Uh, so there's an ongoing call uh, for um, research visit between one to six months uh, that can happen in any uh, uh, country. It can be a learning job, uh, and can be a research internship, quite flexible uh, with support up to 1,500 uh, euro per month. Uh, um, we will try to extend it for other support opportunities, but that's one of the calls that currently is being um, 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 that 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 has substantial funding, so we can easily uh, support, let's say, two hundred Ukrainian scientists, and a lot of funding is left. So please share it among uh, people that you think think might benefit uh, from it. And in the meantime, uh, we are trying to expand it to other research fields because this cycle will show um, support of um, support of uh, humanities and other fields is actually. Very scarce. 
Um, and yeah, this brings me to the end of my presentation. So I, what I was trying uh, to say that uh, Science for Ukraine after transitioning to an NGO started looking in other ways to make sure that we keep the topic alive and we are continuing looking into support options for uh, Ukrainian scientists and they will evolve over time. Uh, we are volunteers for Ukrainian scientists largely based on uh, research cooperation in the future, uh, grant application and donations. So uh, please help spread in the world about Science for Ukraine in case you know people that uh, would like to join uh, um, the organization or partner and help us support these uh, support programs. Um, um, get in touch with us. We will be happy to start this discussion. And I think uh, before going to questions, so there will be any, we can uh, open uh, the next poll. Yes, Sasha. Of course. Yeah, we can actually go two polls after each other, so three and four, because they are connected. Uh, these are questions. Yeah. Is, 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 as you like. Is, it, is poll number four okay or poll number three? Whatever. Tell me. Uh, poll number, well, it, it's three and four uh, uh, together. Both of yeah. them focus. Uh, so we would like to hear, uh, as you as see, we are focusing on various support um, opportunities, uh, so support uh, uh, pathways for Ukrainian scientists. Um, and both of the questions um, asking about your opinion about what you think actually um, matters the most. Very well. So please vote. This is uh, the poll about bottlenecks or what impedes international travel the most. On your screen now. Thank you for your answers. Here are the results. And Sasha, over to you for a comment. Um, yeah, so um, actually, uh, as you will see from the uh, presentation of Michael, uh, the problem of limited funds uh, is very area dependent. And in many cases, funds are being underutilized. So there are many, many uh, uh, positions that get zero applications. So. Uh, it's good to realize that there are um, actually quite a bit of um, funds. Uh, uh, it's important just to raise information about it. Um, legal restriction, that's something that we saw and still see. So um, less than 5% of our database are available for scientists to apply from UK. And that's an ongoing struggle. And we are trying, uh, yeah, that, that's something that we really, really need to work on because the scientific system is just a funding scheme is really not designed. It's a unique case uh, that needs to be uh, tackled. But uh, the lack of funding, please wait a few minutes for a presentation of Michael. I think it will be very interesting to see. And maybe poll number three we can uh, open now. Please, Sasha. Can you read the poll and? Yes, yeah, so uh, which area should be prioritized to uh, for recovery and reconstruction of Ukrainian science post-conflict? We have results in. Yes, because of people are voting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's also, um, yeah, and that that's also quite in line with results that 
my colleagues by from the survey from the Ukrainian perspective, things that people find very important on the flexibility uh, of support opportunities that they are looking for, because uh, for majority of Ukrainian scientists that uh, relocated abroad, uh, that consider it a temporary choice with the possibility that they, they want to have a possibility to return. So that's something that definitely needs to be taken into uh, consideration and international collaboration and partnership, obviously, because science needs to, that's something where we are trying to develop funding programs. So it's very rewarding, very nice to see that at least within the webinar, uh, participants have a similar view on it and so far supported by um, research as well. Um, I think that's a very nice point to uh, switch to presentation of Michael. Thank you very much, Sasha. Now it's time to listen to Michael uh, Rose. Michael is a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition in Munich. Uh, being an economist and statistician, uh, Michael studies the sciences itself but also digitization and data protection. One of the studies mm -hmm. that inspired him most were one of the persecution of German scientists during the Nazi uh, era and support measures. Michael is one of the co-founders of Science for Ukraine. We are very happy to have you, my Michael. Please, over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Katarina, and for the introduction and the invitation and uh, thank you everybody for being here it's great uh, to speak about this <clears throat> so um this is a, a, a survey uh, and i'm reporting the 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 results of the survey a joint work with some volunteers but also externals um so external to the uh, ngo and we spoke a bit about already about the data set that we assembled the the <clears throat> The current state of the data set you can see here. So it's still ongoing. We still collect uh, help offers, but of course, the, uh, the big phase of new offers uh, is actually over, but there's still some more. So what we collect are uh, often statements, short statements, and we classify them. Uh, is it a position? Is it a scholarship? Um, in the beginning, we had a lot of joint application suggestions. So if you remember, for example, the German Humboldt Foundation, there were many uh, programs that said, hey, find um, a local host and then you apply together. <clears throat> so this is a joint application, for example, and we classify them also to which disciplines they are and who they are open for. So what we did is we we asked ourselves what kind of help of us were actually in demand the most. And unlike many other surveys that were uh, conducted over the past two years, we asked the host. So we have a really large database. So here you see this is the, the latest entry is from uh, two days ago. So more than 3000 entries, but you have to keep in mind, by the way, that not every entry means one person. So sometimes we have entries that are open for multiple. Sometimes uh, they're open for students and they say, all students can uh, you know, transfer their, their, their credits. So the, the offers are quite la diverse in nature. And we want to ask so what kind of offers, what kind of support offers uh, uh, in need the most? Is it social sciences? Is it scholarships? Is it those in, I don't know, in neighboring countries? So we froze the uh, database last year in May and we uh, included the following uh, categories, um, uh, positions, uh, resources. So resources means no money involved. Scholarship means uh, like a position, but uh, no work contract. So, you know, bursary or scholarship. Um, and uh, the joint application of us, but only only for researchers. So here you can see a little bit the distribution on the on the bottom, um, uh, according to the, uh, the the categories, like sorry, uh, according to the disciplines. Um, you see, for example, that in natural sciences we actually have the most uh, offers in total, um, followed by uh, medical and health science. Sorry, uh, the social science. Yeah, I have medical and health sciences. Uh, engineering, and then followed by social science. So we wanted to ask um, which discipline is uh, needs more of it? Um, where do we have probably enough? Do we need uh, more from this? And so on. And now, before I continue, uh, now is a good time to ask the next poll. 
If you're a Ukrainian scientist, what did you base your decision to leave Ukraine on the most? So which single factor was uh, most important? Of course, you didn't leave them the first options for you. Is it the specifics of the offer? So pay duration, whether you can keep your affiliation? Is it the country or was it most important to have a close topical map match? All right, so how are the results looking? All right, so the specifics of the offers were um, most important for half, um, and uh, the country and the topical match equally important. Uh, that matches uh, very well what, what we find. Um, we're going to find that the, the country didn't matter so much. Uh, that was a bit surprising actually to many many policymakers that we presented this the survey to um and the, the answer to this is usually once you account for the types and the disciplines then the country doesn't matter so much and because the countries have a different you know composition of, of offers that they have um you see different demand for countries but you have to control for that so that's a, a very great poll i might come back to this later and maybe also during the q a let me continue with the talk. Um, so just some basic statistics. Um, we surveyed two and a half thousand offers, which were uh, in our database until May last year. And we surveyed them throughout summer. 22% um, participated. Some offers belong to multiple people, in which case uh, they would count double. Um, and from this survey, so from the 440 or so, uh, which replied, uh, we know that 600 60 Ukrainians were supported. So from these uh, 440, so that means either um, hired or joint application initiated or a person came to sit in the office even though I couldn't pay, so multiple things. And if we extrapolate this to the entire database that was included back then, that means uh, more than 3,000 Ukrainians have benefited from, uh, from, the, uh, from the database. We asked, um, three questions, but here in the survey, I'm, I'm in the talk, I'm only going to focus on the first. So we asked how many Ukrainians solicited um, uh, for the for the uh, advertised offer, how many of them were eligible, and how many ultimately benefited. Um, just some basic figures. So here you see on the left how many solicitations or applications were there. So meaning just someone reaching out. And you see the brown bar to the very left, that is the amount of offers which have not received a single solicitation. So no one reached out. So more than 120 of the offers, uh, no, one, no one reached out, probably didn't fit or, well, probably mostly didn't fit. So that's what we wanted to find out, right? So the others, the other bars, meaning uh, it can go up to 800. So for one offer, up to 800 people requested, hey, can I, is this for me? And this offer was, um, a joint scholarship, a remote scholarship, in fact, by the Harvard University, Harvard Ukraine Research Institute and uh, the Institute for um, Advanced Studies in Vienna. <clears throat> and when we just take these, where they received some uh, solicitations and we just ask, so how many did you hire or help in the end? Then you go to the blue bar to the right. And here you also see that even though someone reached out, still about 20%, 20 to 30 percent I could not help right so um, either it was full already or couldn't leave the country or was too far away so that's what we wanted to find out what explains this pattern uh, at first glance we see that the social science and humanities actually have the um, highest share of solicitations so when you go here to the middle column then you see it's uh, close to 90 percent so that means 90% of offers attached to the social sciences or humanities 
had a solicitation, so someone reaching out. So this um, compares to natural sciences where just less than 70%, right? And from those that reached out to the host and asked, hey, do you have a position for me or something? What share of these were eligible, right? And then you go to the uh, average eligibility um, um, column, and you see that uh, often the people asking for help were not eligible. So it was up to the host to determine what's eligibility. Uh, often they applied standards of sufficient uh, English proficiency, um, also topical fit and so on. And you see for the social science and humanities, again, it's uh, it's the highest. And, in, and if we then go to the last part, the last column, and ask so how many were applied, uh, how many were helped in the end. So here you see it's, even, it's actually the lowest share for social science and humanities. While for the others, it's... Uh, up to a quarter, up to a third even. Um, <clears throat> so how many of these applications were successful? And this is the first indication here that in social science and humanities, we probably didn't have enough. All right. Um, as I already spoke about in the beginning, the composition within countries matters. Um, <clears throat> here you have a very colorful graph um, that shows the distribution for four selected countries. So the higher, the, um, the larger the bubble, and the more red it is, that means the higher, the more positions, sorry, the more help offers in, in this category. So for example, here, Poland, this sticks out the big red bubble in natural sciences. That means close to half of all offers registered to Poland were positions in the natural sciences. Um, if we uh, instead, for example, go to Italy, social sciences here, uh, this, this gray scholarship that's gray bubble that's for scholarships, that's about uh, 30%, 25%. So 25% of all Italian offers were social sciences scholarships. And it, as we later going to find that uh, relative to positions, scholarships were much more in demand. So much more because uh, probably because less strings attached. It was, for example, important to Ukrainians that they could keep their home affiliation. With a position, you can't do that, right? A position comes with a new contract. Uh, and this pattern already explains why, even though Italy had fewer overall offers um, than Poland, there were uh, Italy was quite you know, popular. Um, in Poland, just uh, most of this was the natural sciences, right? So, and um, you can make these comparisons also looking at Germany, uh, highest share of scholarships. So, when you're looking mostly at the specifics of the offers, like in the poll. Uh, um, like um, a medium term duration, no strings attached, um, maybe even accommodation, then Germany offered more flexibility. So the question then is, so what matters more? The country, the specifics, the discipline. So we put all of this into a linear regression and uh, you have the results here. <clears throat> That's a coefficients plot, um, one bar and dot for each variable that we have in there, uh, which are on the left. So joint application resources, scholarships. So these are relative to positions. Then we have other specifics. Is it remote? And then we have the uh, the disciplines. And finally, we have all the countries here, Austria, Baltics, the Benelux countries, so Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, and so on, which is relative to Germany. So um, stuck in the bottom, on the top, when we see a blue bar to the left of the dotted line, that means it's significantly less important than a position. And when it's to the right, like scholarship, so this means that scholarships were significantly more in demand than positions, controlling for everything else. So holding fixed the same country, holding fixed the same disciplines, and so on. And what we also see is that social science and humanities were received many more, uh, were much more likely to receive any solicitation. <clears throat> and um, the only country preference that we found here is that Benelux countries received more applications or more often than uh, than Germany. And when we look at the number, not just did you receive any, but really asking how many, then we have the same, very much the same picture. Um, scholarships more relevant than positions. Uh, social science and humanities much more relevant. And uh, yeah, the Benelux, um, I think disappeared, but instead here we have Asia. So compared to Germany and holding constant for all the other specifics, we found that positions in East Asia were less likely to hire someone or to help someone, probably because it was simply uh, too far away. Yeah. 
Um, in the interest of time, maybe uh, I skip over this. So what I skipped is the motivation that we asked. Uh, let me come to the summary here. Um, what we found is that scholarships were most popular even when they were not remote. Uh, the highest demand were in social science and humanities and barely any country preference. Um, with our study, we can basically answer, should we have had more of this and that? What we can't answer is, should we have had more of something that wasn't there? Uh, so we only asked, um, okay, here are the specific, this is the bundle, how many applications did you receive? Um, we couldn't ask, so like, you know, should there have been more long-term remote fellowships? Because there were not, right? So of course this would have been a great thing, but uh, so that's probably a limitation. Um, and based on our study, we, we conclude that, well, there should have been more on social science humanities. In the paper and the study, we, we speculate why is that social science humanities, why is that so large? Um, we came up with three reasons. So first of all, it's quite important among Ukrainian women. And as a matter of fact, I mean, Ukrainian men were only, only few were allowed to leave. So it was mostly women who could leave. And one third of all Ukrainian scientists are in social science and humanities. So one third is about in, in, uh, in engineering. Another third is social science humanities and the rest is in the other disciplines. Um, and then probably also the, the relative affection by funding cuts, um, indicating a higher pressure for social science and humanities, uh, humanities scholars to leave. And yeah. I guess now it's time to to close. Um, I look forward to uh, some questions if you have them, and uh, also to the Q and A. Thank you. Being with us uh, always, I would like to give the floor to Sanita for a closing word. We are all all very uh, sensitive to what you do, and we are really grateful. Yes, thank you. Uh, we are also very grateful for this uh, webinar. It's wonderful. Um, event to mark the second uh, the entering the third year and let's see what it brings and perhaps we uh, will be lucky to build new collaborations with the uh, persons listening uh, to this webinar so thank you very much everyone for uh, being here and also for your support thank you very much it is time to close uh, congratulations. We will uh, be happy to share the recording after it will be edited. Uh, stay strong, uh, Slav Ukraine. All the best to all of you. Let's keep the message uh, strong. Goodbye.